Zach, thanks for being on the show. You're welcome. So today we are talking about fasting, a very particular kind of fasting mm. that you have recently experienced. I've just completed my third one, yeah. Tell us what kind of fast it was. Yeah, sure. So I'll, I'll give a bit of context first because it wasn't just a fast. Um, it was kind of a personal challenge in several different ways. Trying to see how I could survive for a week without most things. I would go camping by myself. I would only take a very limited amount of equipment and no food. So I took a tent and a sleeping bag. Uh, this was in November in Australia, so not particularly cold. So I wasn't worried about um, getting really cold. Although a few days in, my body temperature was so low that I was rugged up in everything I had. Um, I also took no kind of technology, no phone, nothing like that. Not even a book, not even a pencil and a paper to write down my ideas. I just took a couple of sets of clothes, uh, a toothbrush, a cup for water and the tent and the sleeping bag. And then I had some other personal projects, which were kind of like secondary goals, which was to make some sort of item, some sort of ancient item in like a bowl or something out of clay. Um, so I took an ax and a mortar and pestle as kind of other tools. My thinking was that I wanted to put myself through kind of a, a, a defrag, my, a mental and physical defrag where I would put myself through a certain amount of suffering intentionally to see how I would deal with it. And so it's suffering in that you have nothing to eat and that's usually enough, but I also had no shoes. Cause again, I was going no technology. So within a couple of days, my feet were all cut up. Man. Okay. I'm just going <laughs> to, I'm just going to pause you there so I can take a, a breath and, yeah. and not get too stressed out on your behalf. So it wasn't just a fast. It was a whole like kind of a reset in a way, or are you saying yeah. a defrag? I think defrag um, is a nice way to, to explain it. Well, can I just take a step back? Did, sure. did you feel fragged before you went or was it an experiment to see what benefits could come from it? Yes. So a little bit of uh, like, I felt like I wanted to do something challenging for myself. And I thought this would be something I would want to do. And it was because I wasn't particularly stressed or anything in my life. Um, but this was just a type of existence which most people in human history would be challenged. Like the, the daily challenges that we go through today are very different to the daily challenges that you'd go through in this situation. Um, and so it was very interesting to put yourself in that position because you really get a new lease on life and your perspectives change and your values change. Putting yourself through voluntary, I would say physical suffering was very good to understand mental suffering because a lot of the suffering we in our society today experience is all about a perceived mental threat, which isn't really a threat to your daily existence. So, oh, I'm not going to be able to pay my rent in three weeks time, or, oh no, I'm not going to have enough money to retire, or, oh, this person at work said something really disrespectful and you're still thinking about it four days later. All these, all these things that were just, they're very abstract. And this, I felt for me was really valuable because it removed a lot of those abstractions. So the, the things you would think about is how am I going to walk from here to there uh, without cutting my feet up even more than they already are? How am I not going to get sunburned? How am I not, not going to get eaten by mosquitoes? Because I had no uh, insect repellent. But what I, what I realized within a couple of days was it was a lot harder than I expected. And so I had these other secondary goals that I briefly touched on, like making something out of clay or... You know, doing yoga every day was a goal. And I didn't do any of those secondary goals. I was just, within a few days, I was just like, I need to not die um, and just make it to the end of this. How long was it, this experience for? It was for one week. Was there a preparation period? Yeah, good question. So what I decided to do was have a, a three-day or so, maybe four-day 
lean in period where I would gradually eat less and I was doing it with someone else. So I was kind of having that support as well and they were helping me prepare the food. So having just like a smoothie and then a salad for lunch, like a smoothie for breakfast and a salad for lunch and then uh, taper down to nothing. And then the same at the other end. So taper up after the seven days. Right, right. So did you do it? Did you actually achieve what you set out to do? Not, not quite. I, I didn't feel great about it afterwards. And so I wanted to do it again better. So I, it went from Saturday to Saturday. By Thursday, I was quite desperate. I was just having water, just rainwater, uh, nothing else. And I would get hiccups. My diaphragm would just convulse and it would be really painful and it would just happen out of nowhere. And um, I just had a little, luckily I had a little sachet of salt in my backpack, uh, which was just enough to stop that from happening. But yeah, I was, I was pretty desperate. And there was a few times when I was like, okay, I'm just going to go into my tent and just wait out the last couple of days. Mm. I took a spare little tent and I was going to go for like a little hike out deeper into the woods and do another kind of side mission. And, and that didn't happen. Mm. So, so when you said, you know, were you happy with the experience? I didn't, not quite. Uh, but I was pretty happy with the fast in and of itself. In terms of the fasting, how does your body feel afterwards? Like, can you instantly sort of feel the benefits of the fasting? That's, that's a good question. So within, within a couple of days, your body has used up all its carbohydrate stores. So all the sugar in your blood and all the uh, glycogen and so on in your liver and your muscles. Mm -hmm. And then you start burning uh, proteins and fats. And if you're not adding anything else into the mix, your energy level and your body temperature really plummets. So my energy levels were very, very low. So I had to plan how am I going to do things so that I would do them as efficiently as possible. Yeah, so how does your body feel afterwards? Um, you feel kind of drawn out, like you've lost all the... You feel very fibery, like your, your muscles and your body just feels very sucked out. Like well, you, you would have lost some muscle mass. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. I, would have yeah, I would have lost quite a bit of, uh, so I did weigh myself before and after and take photos. There wasn't a huge amount of visual difference, but I weighed about six kilos less at the end, uh, which is not sustained weight loss, of course. That's just like, cause you've, your body's just sucked out everything. Mm -hmm. But yeah, you feel very clean. And so afterwards, my diet certainly improved because I was very aware of food. So your awareness of what you're eating is very different and you're, you're taking it far more consciously than you w normally would. And that slowly like uh, dissipates. So what would be the difference between one that's that long, like seven days, and say one of the more common 24 hour, 48 hour fast. What sort of difference would you notice between that? Have you done those shorter ones before? Oh yeah, for yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah. So I had done some practicing before jumping into this. I wouldn't suggest anyone ever do something like this, you know, in general, but certainly not if you haven't got experience. This was just a radical, not recommended thing to test. Like, is this possible? And more than just, is it possible? Cause I was pretty sure it was, but what happens to you? Like right. what happens to your mind? What happens to your body? So this, this one wouldn't be something that you'd say, I'm going to do that like once every three or six months or something no. for, for long-term benefits. Cause it's not really for that. What I would do is, and what I've done the two subsequent ones is taken a little bit of food so that I could do say a 36 hour fast, eat a small meal and then do another 36 hour fast immediately after and then eat a small meal. And then again, and that would be a week and there would be a few small meals sprinkled in there. So I'm not getting to that real desperation level because that was, uh, one really not fun. Like it, it weighs on you mentally, uh, where you're, you're not really, you get depressed and you're not able to function very well, do anything. Yeah. So I wouldn't do anything longer than say a 36 hour fast for actual benefit, maybe three days if you were doing things in a safe way with like electrolytes and things like that. But the, the idea of fasting, um, in some way 
I think is really beneficial because it just gives your body a break. And I was also giving my body a break, not only with food, so it could kind of recalibrate because if you're constantly, like I generally overeat, um, if you're constantly putting food in it, it's just dealing with what it's got. It hasn't really got a chance to heal itself. So this was kind of a chance to heal it, heal myself physically through food and kind of deplete, get the, you know, the fuel tank actually empty because it's normally more than full. Um, and also let the mind reset because we're constantly just doing what's the next thing, what's the next thing. And there's, you just go from day to day and day and you don't have a huge amount of time to reflect. And this was a really valuable experience primarily because of the, the mental side because it was, I had, it was incredibly boring to have no mental stimulation. For someone who's addicted to the internet, it was very boring. So I had no books, no things to write with, nothing to do mm. other than just sit there with your thoughts. You can go for a hike, but again, that takes energy. You can just lie down. So I spent a lot of time just lying on my back and just looking up at the trees or I would walk somewhere and sit and just contemplate, what am I doing? What's happening? Why am I doing this? Mm. You know, what, what do I want to be? What do I want to do? What impact do I want my life to have on other people? If you're, if you're constantly distracted, you're not thinking about those deeper questions. And I would say that was probably the primary benefit, at least for me, was letting your mind that kind of static noise dissipate and then you can hear the signal underneath and your actual mind is giving you thoughts. It had long-term residual benefit, I would say for me. And it's kind of like doing mushrooms, but not fun. <laughs> so I remember uh, in the previous episode, Sven talking about mushrooms and people thinking that they're very uh, insightful when they're really not. Uh, this kind of takes out the fun side. And so you definitely know that people aren't doing it just because it's fun. Your whole world becomes very, very slow. And it's really dictated by the sun, which for me was interesting because that connection to our ancestors of how they would have lived where their notion of what time it was, was based on the sun and their speed of life would have been much slower than our speed of life it was very uh, satisfying and connecting. So you learn about yourself, I think. And that was one of the biggest benefits. So if, I, if you didn't have this edifice of society and the technologies you use every day, what would you be? You're just, you're just a, fra a frail little person. And the notions of what you would do or not do, your ethics also change. Because I think by day five, I was getting hungry enough that I was contemplating trying to kill a goanna or something because I was desperate. <laughs> you didn't start hallucinating. <laughs> no, I don't think. No, far. no, I, I wasn't hallucinating. Well, how would you know? I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I was no one else around. <laughs> you just couldn't see them. <laughs> you, you synchronize to the environment that you're in. And so I specifically chose a place that I was very familiar with, um, that had a water supply that I knew was drinkable. Uh, I knew there was a bunch of things around that I could do that hikes and such things. And there was a beach so I could swim, but just the, the very basic things that humans would have had to deal with, like not getting sunburned, not running out of water, having something on your feet. So your feet don't get cut up. Um, having somewhere to sleep. One, one benefit is the appreciation you have for those things, those comforts of life when you come back. I think it's a general statement about camping is you're putting yourself in a situation where you're intentionally making your, your situation less comfortable than it could be so that when you come back to what you actually have, you're far more appreciative of what you have. You feel that gratitude. And I think that's the opposite notion then is the ruling ideology in our society, which is I'm not happy with what I have. So I need to get more nicer things. I need to get a bigger TV, a softer bed, a bigger house, a faster car. 
because what I have isn't adequate. And that's just completely backwards in my view because most people have more than what they need. I'm curious about how you got into the idea of actually doing this. Well, one thing that probably did slightly influence me was this YouTube channel called Primitive Technology. And this is a guy, I think he's in Northern Queensland, where he just goes out and he builds things from scratch, like actually from scratch. Oh, I've seen some of those. Yeah. And so yeah. he'll build an ax and then with that ax, he'll build a house and then he'll live in the house and then he'll build a kiln and then he'll build bricks in the kiln to build a nicer house. And he's just actually from scratch. And I always watch that. And the, the videos are so interesting because he doesn't narrate them. He just shows you. And I always thought that's just so cool. It's a hobby that costs nothing. It's a hobby that doesn't require other people's participation. It's just you against nature and you can understand how nature works. You can work out how, what the consistency of clay needs to be to build things out of clay. And then I was always fascinated by the idea of fasting, depriving your body and seeing what would happen. And I'd tried a bunch of times at home, but I was never really able to go as long as I wanted to go because I lacked the willpower. And I thought the only way I will be able to do this is if I don't give myself an option. So you've done that. If you were going to do something similar again, mm. how would you do it differently? I've done a couple of others with other things. Like I would take uh, pencils and paper or, or something, and I would take a little bit of food, like a few cans of beans. Um, and they were way, way easier. And so I think I'm ready. Like I'll be doing my fourth one again soon. And I'll probably push it a little bit further now that I know what I can do. From my nutrition knowledge, I mixed up something that I would deem to be very useful in these kind of situations, which was kind of like a survival mix, which was a few different protein powders. So pea protein and some other things like that to, to retain some of that muscle mass. And then some things like uh, Indian gooseberry amla powder uh, for lots of vitamin C to keep your immune system very strong. And some other things like wheatgrass powder or things like that, just to have some greens. And then some things for flavoring. So like some cocoa, some cinnamon, nutmeg. So it's kind of like chocolatey. And that was, that was very successful with the last two that I did. Cause I would mix that powder in with some uh, peanut butter and uh, kind of fruits and nuts. So dates or sultanas and you know, cashews, almonds, things like that. And that would be very, very, very dense calories, but I would only, I would go through like one jar in the entire week. Cause you just have a little spoonful and then lots of water cause it's very thick. And that would provide a lot of fat and protein. So you'd stay in ketosis and lots of micronutrients. So you're not feeling as drawn out. And um, the last one I did, I felt totally fine. It, it, was, it was barely even noticeable. I've considered potentially doing one a bit longer to see what that would be like, like in, in t instead of modulating the intensity, modulating the length. Mm -hmm. Now this is not something that you recommend to people in general, is it? So for the record, I do not suggest anyone do this. This is not a good idea to do. This was just a test for myself to see if I was capable of doing it. And it was very hard. And you just become in your mind, all these other things that you think about, you forget about, cause you're just thinking about food. If you're at a healthy or underweight, you should not do this because this is for fat people. <laughs> <laughs> cause I was because thinking it wasn't, it, it sounds like, yeah, it, it, it would be, it would simply be a suicide mission for me. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. If you're very lean, you're not going to have the type of reserves in terms of muscle and fat as a buffer. And so it's going to be dangerous. Mm. It, it's good for a certain body type like mine, because you know, this is potentially a flattering camera angle that isn't showing exactly how fat I am, but I have plenty of muscle and fat to lose. Mostly fat. If you, if you are larger, then you're going to be more capable of doing it because you're going to have your body. But if you're not practiced in it, 
Like if you're a large person, but you've never fasted before because you're constantly eating six, every six hours while you're awake, it's going to be quite a shock to your system and it's going to be quite hard to adapt. But th this was fun for me because I felt very comfortable in my own body to be able to push it because I'd done enough in the past to think this was possible. And I think most people throughout, throughout history, your food availability would have been far less predictable than it is today. There's not a pantry and a fridge all the time. So it would have been just by default, you might have to fast for 36 hours or a couple of days. After two days, you, you for, from people who are large, you, you're going to be pretty uncomfortable still because you've really depleted your sugars. And so you're, you're going to feel very drawn out and very tired, low energy. But there's a long time between that and you actually starving to death where you can just be miserable. And that's what I was aiming to be in. <laughs> Not just push up against it. You wanted to sort of really flirt in that, in that yeah. zone. I, I intentionally wanted to do that because I, th I felt like putting yourself in intentional suffering like that voluntarily, it's like dunking yourself in cold water or forcing yourself to do a really long uh, run or something. It makes you stronger mentally and stronger in other ways to deal with other aspects of life. So the normal bullshit, stressful parts of life get to you less because you've strengthened your own constitution through putting yourself through something like that and knowing that you can go through it. And I think that's where the value comes from putting yourself through some form of voluntary suffering that is just enough to make you uncomfortable and to pull your thoughts into that experience so that you're present with that experience rather than thinking about the past and the future. Well, I'm extremely glad that you didn't die. It's been great talking to you. We'll talk again. Please have me back. This was really fun. Excellent. Thank you, Zach. Thank you, Simon.